What's going on, YouTube? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back with another video. And I did a bunch of laser disc spotlight videos last week. I figured we'll do a few different things this week, mix it up a little bit. Uh, one of the first things I figured I'd talk about is a television show. And not just any regular television show that you can catch over the air on your broadcast antenna, but one of the kind of new breed of television series, uh, kind of kicked off by. House of Cards on Netflix, and now Amazon Prime, the kind of premier arm of Amazon.com, which originally started more as uh, a cheap form of shipping for people that you know ordered a lot of materials through Amazon.com and quickly began to uh, blossom into streaming video and now streaming music and uh, you know, cloud services, etc., uh, they have also decided to get into the game of original content. Um, you know, nobody wants HBO and, and Stars and Showtime to have all the fun. So they quickly uh, began um, creating uh, pilots, and they would air them and actually see how Amazon customers would relate to the pilots and, and feedback. And that uh, originally uh, led to uh, Alpha House becoming a series. And I actually saw an interesting um, Chris Carter series called The After, which I thought was going to get turned into a, uh, a feature series, but I guess not. Um, but this uh, title I'm going to talk about now is part of the, the kind of second wave, and I actually missed the pilot when it originally aired, but it's called Bosch. And it's based on a long-running run, uh, detective novel series by Michael Connolly, which I have not read. Um, and it stars Titus Welliver, who you've probably never heard of, but have seen in, in tons of things. Uh, most recently, I remember him from uh, Sons of Anarchy as uh, Jimmy O'Fallon. It's, it seemed like everybody who was an Irish character in Sons of Anarchy you know, wasn't really uh, loaded with an Irish accent. And uh, But he, I also remember him as the Man in Black from some of the last seasons of Lost. And... Uh, He's kind of one of those like character actors, you know, kind of striking features, and uh, he's his natural kind of non-Irish voice is this kind of deep resonating, uh, you know, kind of gravelly kind of voice, and he plays the the titular character Bosch. And if you've uh, you know heard of the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch, you're thinking, oh, well, that's a neat little subtle reference there. Uh, not so subtle because this character's name is Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, though people do call him Harry for short, uh, mostly much to his chagrin, his daughter. And, um, you know, it does deal in some, you know, interesting, you know, subterranean labyrinthine, you know, darknesses within Los Angeles. And definitely, you know, calling back to films like Heat and, and Michael Mann's L.A., this uh, series uh, features Los Angeles as its own character, really. And uh, so, yeah, I didn't see the, the pilot and it got greenlit and there, I believe there were 10 episodes and sh shot 13 days straight through, just pounded through all these things. I really have no idea how they did, uh, but there's an interesting like kind of shooting diary that Titus Welliver put together that you can check out online. Um, but wow, I mean, talk about ambitious. So they powered through this and um, kind of they they replaced some characters Mimi Rogers came on as a prosecuting attorney that was played by portrayed by someone else in the original pilot version so they kind of tuned things up a little bit um script wise it's 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 sometimes a mixed bag like some of the in it seemed like in the the beginning of the show and the end of the show or the end of the season uh the dialogue was a little clunkier and then it it seemed to hit a stride in the middle of the series for some reason and uh, during that portion of the season, everything was just very natural. Um, there was even like a few kind of like stagey moments that, that felt forced, uh, in particular like, involving Bosch and, and one of his superiors who doesn't appreciate him. Um, and yeah, so Bosch is a, is a detective on a Hollywood homicide and not the Hollywood homicide as, you know, featured in the film of the same name with Harrison Ford chasing down hip hop artists in a pink huffy bicycle. <laughs> This is definitely, like I mentioned before, more of like a Michael Mann-esque kind of vibe. Um, I swear, there's a character that they're uh, chasing down um, that, uh, as a suspect for murder, and I swear they use the exact same hallway, too, that uh, uh, John Doe's apartment was uh, situated in the film 7. I'm going to have to do some research on that. I'm not sure if that's actually true or not, but I mean, it looked identical. 
So Los Angeles being a huge character here, and the rest of the film is is comprised of three books of the series kind of squished together. And, and that's kind of apropos because Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch was um, often uh, working on triptychs, you know, uh, works of art that are broken into three portions. And uh, this story arc throughout this whole season is is very much a triptych. It's it's involving st- the the lead kind of story in which a uh, a child's bones are discovered in the hills of Los Angeles. And uh, I appreciated that story because skateboarding comes into it. And I was a big uh, Bones Brigade kind of enthusiast, you know, Paul Peralta and, and, and you know, freak back in the day. And uh, a Mike McGill skateboard is a kind of key plot point and, uh, in this uh, saga. And I thought that was pretty cool because, you know, I can relate to that. And I know what a Mike McGill skateboard means to a kid from the 80s. <laughs> And how important that is, and how it could be fatal potentially. Um, so there's that saga uh, where you know the that taps into Bosch's history of you know childhood, you know neglect and abuse, and and uh, some horrible situations he grew up with, and and feeling like he has to you know give justice to this this child that was found you know decades later. And then there's a story that ties in with that with Jason Gedrick of Iron Eagle fame. I don't know how or why or where they dug him out, but he's great. Is this really, really um, just, you know, he's a creepy serial killer too, but he's got a we- just an interesting vibe to him. Like, y- you think you know what he's going to do because you've seen so many episodes of Criminal Minds and Law and Orders and stuff like that. So there's this pattern of serial killer behavior on films. As I mentioned Seven before, and I'd love the film Seven, but I, I, I don't appreciate what it's done for you know, the, the kind of crime film genre, because it spawned a series like Saw and everything like that. Um, where serial killers on film don't really have any correlation to serial killers in, in reality. Uh, they're never... Um, you know, driven by just, you know, quick impulses or, or uh, convenience. It's always some sort of grand machination and some sort of philosophical kind of manifesto that they're, you know, writing large in the flesh of their victims and that kind of crap. Um, and that's that's what you get, you know, because, I mean, as, as a human race, we don't really want to uh, embrace the concept that a serial killer is probably that guy you said hi to at the gas station two hours ago. There was probably a girl in his trunk, and she's getting sawed up right now. So, you don't want to embrace that reality. <laughs> Jason Gedrick's character in this film, however, is a little bit closer to, you know, your tried and true um, traditional killer. And and sometimes you think you know what he's going to do in a Hollywood sense, and he doesn't. You know, there's a, a great scene in one portion where he very meticulously... Uh, gathers some matches and a candle and goes into the room and you're like, oh, he's clearly going to set this place on fire. But no, he just lights a memorial candle and you know, walks out of the room quietly. Um, and he does have some kind of grander um, structures to his uh, his killings and things like that and, and, and latches on to Bosch as this kind of, you know, equal on the other side of the law, of course. And they're going back and forth. So they're, they're a little bit of uh, elements of traditional, you know, Cops and uh, not cops and killers kind of dynamics there, uh, but it's it's laid out really well. And the other portion of the triptych is is Bosch's story down the middle, and that's kind of peppered with obviously a lot of family situation. He's he's left behind a previous relationship, and his uh, his ex wife is also involved in uh, the crime fighting world. So they are often you know forced back into each other's lives, and the fact that they share a daughter as well. And the, Bosch's daughter is like the, the kind of one character that he uh, appreciates and, and wants to connect with on a human level. He's very world weary. It's like a you know a modern noir for the rest of the film. And uh, he doesn't easily connect with characters, but he does want to connect with his daughter, despite the fact that, you know, trying to solve two, you know, murders at the same you know time lends uh, very little spare time in his life. Um so yeah, so that's the middle section, and then the the all other surrounding kind of icing on that is the the kind of like political um, scene in Los Angeles, and Lance Reddick from Lost and Fringe and tons of other things appears um, 
as a as a character that's trying to you know buck for some serious promotions and reorchestrate a lot of the political infrastructure of the police force and you know the the Los Angeles scene you know with the DA and everything like that and then there's a a, a scenario very early on in the series where Bosch um, takes down a perp and is accused of having done so you know be, uh, with uh, with malice because the the gentleman was unarmed. And he has to routinely uh, appear at court dates and, and represent himself. And so he's got that stigma, that black cloud hanging over him as the rest of the case progresses. And then he gets involved with a female co-worker and uh, goes from there. But it's very laid out, uh, very much like a novel that's maybe not the, the best novel you've ever read or the most you know in, insanely inventive but just a total page turner, and you want to, and and this this show is eminently marathonable. <laughs> it's one of those things you're going to want to just power through all the episodes. Um, it's great, yeah. And the opening credits are fantastic. Some of the greatest uh, opening credits I've seen in years. Uh, has an interesting kind of like trip hoppy, kind of neo soul um, soundtrack to it, and it's um, it's very it's a very simple. Uh, opening credits thing it's just a, a reverse um it's a mirror effect basically so whatever's on the bottom is also mirrored on the top but it creates this otherworldly uh imagery of you know subway cars and uh you know hi highway underpasses and there's a uh an end shot of downtown los angeles and the skyline as as uh, dusk kind of uh, gives way to day and it's it's amazing. It looks like something out of a science fiction film, even though it's just a simple you know reverse mirror image, um, and that's that's great. And that kind of you know informs the the feel of the show. Um, so yeah, so it's very much Los Angeles being this prime character and uh, Bosch being this guy trying to do good by his family, working his way through this scenario, and also trying to do good by his moral code and you know give justice to these characters and apparently he was way more of a jerk in the novels so they had to kind of tone that down a little bit in the adaptation uh, but i thought they did a pretty solid job and like i said there was a few moments of clunkiness here and there um some good directors involved ernest dickerson from uh yeah lot, lots of tv shows and things like that but also uh, tales from the crypt demon knight helmed a few episodes um it's got a good steady look to it um and yeah, it's one of those uh, one of those shows that I know if it does come back, I'll end up watching the whole thing. A little bit more edge to it than than a Law and Order or something like that, but not quite as much as a uh, True Detective or something along those lines. Uh, but I did like how it all kind of panned out and and played out all these different elements. It, it bit off a lot, you know, obviously three books worth. Um, but I liked how it revealed things. Like obviously early on in the, in the film you, or in the series, you see that he's on this you know huge stilted house. On the hillside, much like Robert De Niro uh, would be living in in a film like Heat, and you're like, well, how does he afford this? And of course, that is addressed. So there's a lot of kind of onion-like layers to this character that that they don't give you everything that you you want or expect right off the bat, and they'll just peel it away as the series progresses. Uh, so I appreciated that. Tyus Welver's great, uh, you know, solid performance around uh, all around, and you know, definitely delivers that world weariness and uh, that neo noir accent and. Uh, <laughs> not an Irish accent this time. Uh, but yeah, cool show. Definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, also on Prime, definitely uh, scope out the pilot for The Man in the High Castle, adaptation of a great uh, Philip K. Dick novel. And uh, I hear that got picked up for a full series, so I cannot wait to check that out. So I'll give a proper review of The Man in the High Castle when that series drops. But uh, check out the pilot now if you do have Amazon Prime. Uh, scope that out for yourself. And yeah, check out Bosch and tear through every episode I, I dare you not to marathon it even if you think ah oh, this is okay or you know lukewarm or it's you know same kind of material that's been plumbed over and over again but uh no stick with it you'll you'll probably dig it well thanks for hanging out and uh hope you enjoy watching all my videos here on culture dog and uh on my channel here and i got some more laser disc stuff coming up shortly so stick around don't go anywhere i'll be right back